how the natural world erupts in Time Watch. Nearly 200 years ago, the biggest volcanic blast ever recorded shook the world. It was six times greater than Krakatoa and Vesuvius combined. The eruption at Tambora in Indonesia left an indelible mark upon history. It's the biggest death toll in any volcanic eruption that we know of. But that was only the beginning. A year later, a deadly cold descended upon the northern hemisphere. Lurid skies inspired the artist Turner. Out of the freakish cold, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was born. Hundreds of thousands across Europe starved to death. Could the two events really be linked? On opposite sides of the globe, two experts set out to find the answer. Their quest will unearth the first evidence of a lost kingdom and reveal how a single volcano in Indonesia could produce the year without summer. Sumbawa, Indonesia. Prior to the eruption in 1815, a little-known trading station in the East Indies. Even today, the massive landmark that dominates it is one of the least studied volcanoes in the world. Harold R. Sigurdsson is a renowned volcanologist. He's the authority on the Roman remains at Pompeii where he was first to discover the bodies of the victims of Vesuvius. Now he intends to do the same at Tambora. He's traveled 10,000 miles from America to one of the most geologically volatile places in the world. Tambora is just one of Indonesia's 150 active volcanoes. Once the biggest of them all, Tambora is now a gigantic shell sitting on the northern peninsula of this sparsely populated island. When the mountain exploded, the top third of it was blown into the sky, leaving behind the world's largest crater. It's quiet now, and all around is silence. Buried under these forested slopes, is an untouched archaeological secret, the lost world of the people of Tambora. It is said that many thousands were killed here, yet not a single body has ever been recovered. Haraldar is the first person even to look for them. For him, Discovering how the people of Tambora died is crucial to understanding one of the most violent events of the natural world. He is starting his search on the volcano's western slope, where coins predating the eruption have been found. It's been 16 years since I started planning for this expedition. And I've kept it sort of a secret, really. I knew that there was this uh, potential here. And now the excitement, of course, is whether we're going to find this lost village of Tambora. And, uh, well, who knows? Maybe it'll become the Pompeii of the East. But it may be that the Sumbawa Islanders weren't Tambora's only victims. People all over the planet may have suffered and died in its aftermath. Throughout the summer of 1816, frost and snow blanketed the northeastern United States and eastern Canada. And in Europe, from May to September, there was hard, cold 
unremitting rain. Crops failed. Starving people turned into scavengers. But was there a connection between the missing summer and a far distant eruption? At the Tate Gallery in London, climatologist Michael Chenoweth is investigating an unusual source of evidence. He's looking at the work of the artist William Turner. Michael has devoted his career to piecing together diverse data about weather patterns, and Tambora is his passion. To him, these watercolors of Britain's evening skies painted just one year after Tambora erupted, and long before the age of colour photography, are real visual evidence that the skies of 1816 had a rare quality. We see this very enhanced red colour, which is what I would expect to see from a volcano as big as Tambora producing such a massive eruption of uh, dust and debris. And it is comparable to other reports of other volcanoes in history. So to get further hard evidence, Michael starts his latest research at the British Newspaper Archive. His objective is to comb through broadsheets of the time for clues, letters, reports, forecasts. This is from New England in the United States, and it's a rather extensive account of forest fires raging and severe frost at the same time. When I turn the page over, and this is a meteorological record kept by a person in Boston, which gives the information that a meteorologist would expect. Temperatures, winds, the, the force of the wind, general weather conditions. And here we see the freezing temperatures that killed off the crops in New England late in September and which caused the shortest growing season that we know. And these are just two pieces in a puzzle. But weather is global, and I have to go find as many pieces of the puzzle as I can. Back at base camp, Haraldar has been forced to delay his search for the people who died here. Since his arrival, there's been a series of earth tremors which could signal a new eruption. No scientist has checked Tambora since he did it himself, 16 years ago. He needs to make sure the volcano isn't about to erupt again. It's really surprising that there hasn't uh, been a scientific team inside the caldera of Tambora. One of the major reasons for that are the logistics. It's very difficult to get up here. It will take a full-scale, five-day expedition. With Haraldar are geophysicist Lou Abrams and volcanologist Egan Sutawinjaya, and no less than 25 local porters. It's the dry season, and there's no water on the crater rim, so hundreds of gallons have to be lugged to the top. The volcano's rim is 9,300 feet high. But before the eruption, Tambora stood at more than 13,000 feet high. It was the tallest mountain in Indonesia. The cause of the eruption, a chamber full of molten rock, magma, is still there, under the floor, 4,000 meters below the present rim. In 1815, a movement of the earth triggered the build-up of pressure in the chamber. Tambora grew by several meters, and then exploded, sending hot ash almost 30 miles into the sky. Indonesia was a Dutch colony then, and a picture of what happened next can be found in rare first-hand reports filed in the Netherlands. 
Bernice de Jong Boers has spent many hours collating them. It is uh, quite hard to imagine what actually happened. It was a real big disaster. We now estimate that uh, the death toll must have been at least 120,000 people. Estimates from the time suggest this was probably 90% of the island's population, and local accounts are hard to find. But Bernice has located a diary from an unwitting eyewitness on another island, Java, 400 miles away. John Crawford was a British official stationed in Surabaya at the time, and he heard the sound of cannon fire. Crawford assumed the noises were from some kind of naval battle. It even became dark for three days in Surabaya. On the third day up to noon, it was pitch dark. And for three days, I contracted all business by candlelight. The day after, ashes began to fall. John Crawford didn't know it, but he'd witnessed the fallout from the largest volcanic eruption ever recorded. Almost two centuries on, Harold R. and his team are nearing the source of that eruption. They'll camp overnight near the caldera's edge. Well, we're at two and a half kilometers elevation. It's going to get chilly tonight. Up here, above the clouds, all warmth fades with the sun. But there's a glow of excitement in the camp. Haraldar is one of the few people ever to have gone down into the caldera. The magma chamber is still just under the crater's floor. It's vital that he check for any sign that an eruption is on its way. Eruptions can take place on the caldera floor without anyone seeing them. And we know that that happened uh, before, twice actually, because all of a sudden you just see a new uh, lava flow and no one has reported it. Uh, so we need to monitor those in order to establish the condition of the volcano. First light and Haraldar and Egan reach the rim of the crater. Wow, isn't that incredible? It's five miles wide and three quarters of a mile deep. The biggest volcanic crater in the world. Haraldar, who has been studying the volcano for 20 years, has worked out how much mountain had to go into the atmosphere to create this great void. The volume of magma or molten rock that came out of the volcano, now that's a very difficult volume to comprehend. But the Vesuvius eruption of 79 AD is about six cubic kilometers. And the Krakatau eruption of 1883 is about 10 cubic kilometers. Well, this one here is 100, so it takes the price. It is the largest volume of material erupted from a volcano in historical time. At the moment, the volcano is sleeping, but restlessly. Right. The caldera is looking more dangerous than it did when Haraldar last went into it. But that makes it even more important that he carries out an immediate assessment. He can't start an archaeological dig if he thinks there's any chance of an eruption. Hey, Harold, did you hear that? Look at this. Can you see it from where you are? I can't see it, but I can hear it. Yeah. 
Uh, you really watch yourself. I'm not sure what triggered that, but that's a good size one. Rock falls happen all the time in the caldera. The soil is dry and loose, and the sediment unstable. It will take him half a day of almost vertical climbing to reach the caldera floor. As Haraldar begins his descent, Michael travels to the Swiss capital, Bern, to meet a local historian who he hopes will tell him more about the devastating impact of the eruption on Europe. For it was in the Swiss Alps, with their isolated valleys, that the appalling summer of 1816 hit hardest. Now, I read Frankenstein, and I know about Christian Fister is an expert on the history of climate change and has a particular interest in the effects of Tambora. How bad was the weather that summer? It was uh, the coldest summer of the last 500 years. It snowed uh, almost uh, every week right? down uh, to the valleys. And uh, grapes did not ripen. And in the uh, in autumn, potatoes had to be uh, grabbed under the snow. They did not ripen either. With its mountainous landscape and short growing season, Switzerland was particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. All kinds of crops failed altogether. High grain prices meant starvation for many families. Uh, they had to turn to substitutes such as grass or uh, flesh from, uh, from rotten animals. And if people ate this type of food, they became really ill sick. A Swiss traveler described the grim scenes in farm workers' houses. The hunger was painted on their faces. The man was in a terrible state. His head supported by his elbows. He was already too ill to work. The food consisted of boiled grass spiced with some salt, but without butter or any other ingredient. That was their dinner. It's unlikely that many members of this family survived. In this terrible summer, all they had to look forward to was an even worse winter. As the death toll continued to rise, destitute farmers, widows and abandoned children flooded into town. One eyewitness from St. Gallen wrote of streets lined with prostitutes and beggars, gangs of pickpockets, thugs attacking anyone with money. Visiting Switzerland at the time was the British author Mary Shelley. On the shores of Lake Geneva, the frightening weather and unseasonal cold inspired her to dream up her monster brought back from the dead. Half human, half beast. Frankenstein. As the summer of 1816 wore on, more and more people fell victim to starvation. Most of them could only wait and pray. Babies, the old and the vulnerable slipped away in increasing numbers. But it wasn't until the following year that these deaths could be officially attributed to famine. Exact statistics on how many people died directly due to crop failure are therefore almost impossible to calculate. In the Swiss town of Appenzell, the number of deaths doubled from 5,000 in 1815 to 10,000 the following year. So in one Swiss town alone, 5,000 people could have died of starvation. Across the whole of Europe, the estimates are staggering, with famine victims thought to number as many as 200 
thousand. In Indonesia, Haraldar has reached the crater floor. Only a handful of people have got this far before. Now, he is walking directly above the magma chamber, the heart of the volcano. Down here, he is surrounded by a wall more than 4,000 feet high. Its layers can be read like the pages of a book, each one recording a past eruption. The biggest is the top layer, the catastrophic explosion of 1815. The caldera is ringed by steaming vents, gases escaping from inside the earth. The smell of rotten eggs, sulfur dioxide, is overwhelming. There's much more hydrothermal activity in the caldera than there was before. There is a haze from the hydrothermal vents that is now filling the interior of the caldera, a smoky cloud. So that indicates altogether that magma is probably much closer to the surface than it was here when I visited 16 years ago. Mm, it's really soft here and hot. Hope I'm not sinking in into the molten mud here. It's boiling underneath. Although there are no distinct signs that an eruption is imminent, the magma chamber is clearly under pressure. When we get to the caldera floor in Tambora, we are reminded strongly that it's a very active volcano. So the sulfur we see here today is from the same source, from the same magma at great depth beneath this volcano as the sulfur that was emitted explosively in 1815, way up into the stratosphere, and then spread around the globe, causing a global climate change. The minute particles of sulfur spread by high altitude winds produced a barrier that deflected the sun's rays. The effect across the northern hemisphere was first noted in 1816, when the warmth of spring failed to arrive. It wasn't just that, you know, it got cold one week and it got warm the next. I mean, there was variability, but it, it, just, it just locked in the pattern and it just kept repeating itself. Among the record keepers at the time was President Thomas Jefferson, who took daily thermometer readings throughout America's summer. A meticulous observer of nature, he noticed a disastrous combination of drought and severe frosts. Across the continent, crops wouldn't germinate. Newborn calves and lambs died, and the ones that survived couldn't be fed. Many farmers were ruined. Further north, the winter ice never melted. One account from Labrador described the change as a revolution in climate. Ships came in to bring supplies, took them days, even weeks, to beat their way through the ice. It was up to 200 miles off the coast in 1860, and the ships had just tremendous trouble going in, and the people on shore were just desperate to get their annual supplies. Back on the slopes of the mountain, Haraldar is ready to start his search for the lost people of Tambora. Most locals have only recently settled here and have shown little interest in finding them. But Usman, a village leader, has brought the team to a gully where he has found shards of pottery. He thinks his find could indicate the location of the lost kingdom. If he is right, Haraldar and his team could be standing on the remains of an entire population captured in time. Uh, it's been uh, in my mind for a very long time that uh, there was this tremendous potential here of uh, finding the people who uh, met this death at, uh, during this catastrophic eruption. Uh, the numbers of 117,000 people killed in this eruption in the immediate vicinity are staggering, really. It's the biggest death toll in any volcanic eruption that we know of. OK. 
Okay. To confirm the site as a good potential location, the team begin their first survey. Using a ground-penetrating radar machine, Lou Abrams can detect buildings and rice terraces. Both could lead them to human remains. Hey, good data, guys. Good signal. That's just right. Yeah. We still have a... There is no lava here. Instead, the ground is covered in thick layers of ash and pumice. Like Pompeii, when it exploded, Tambora engulfed the people below in a pyroclastic flow, an avalanche of scalding ash, pumice and gas, traveling at over 100 miles an hour. That's certainly not a natural, natural slope. It looks like it got flattened out. Okay, stop right there. Okay, end line six. Okay. But you can see then the there it is, see that right there? showing on the radar a structure of some kind. A sure sign that this is a promising spot is the way the topsoil simply crumbles. Because this is a natural gully, the upper layers of the volcanic deposits have already been washed away to a depth of just a few feet. Haraldar is in luck. There's a very large carbonized beam here, and it's clearly a beam that has been trimmed, worked by man. So it's not just a, any old carbonized tree log, but uh, part of a house, almost certainly. Uh, judging from the size of the beam, I think this is a significant structure. And just in the uh, sand and uh, pumice here, some fragments of glass and pottery shards that give us an indication that we're now in a, in a site that we'll do some digging. This might be it. At the Public Records Office in London, Michael Chenoweth is following up a lead, an untapped source of globe-spanning, day-by-day weather reports from the 1800s. Dispassionate, reliable, ideal for scientific analysis. He's scouring the ship's logs of the British Navy. In the very first entry, he hits the jackpot. Summer, 1816, HMS Inconstant. Every day, exactly at noon, Sir James Lucas Yeo and his first officer meet on the quarterdeck to take a sextant reading of their position. They are off the coast of West Africa, carrying out anti-slavery duties. The ship's position is carefully logged, along with weather reports taken at regular intervals throughout the day and night. And almost 200 years later, the log resurfaces as an invaluable study in climate change. At six, heavy gales with a tremendous sea. At nine, the wind shifted suddenly around the northwest with a very heavy sea. At 9.30, the gig was washed away from the quarter deck. What Michael has discovered is a moving meteorological station. There are readings of the exact temperature, wind patterns, and rainfall for every part of the voyage. And the Inconstance journey is just the start. The same thing was happening on ships sailing all over the globe. Using their logs, Michael will be the first person ever to produce a model of the weather over all the oceans in 1816 and to compare that year with others. There's a superabundance of data. It's just amazing. Every two to four hours, there seem to be, in this log, temperature readings. And this is what I need. I mean, this is the exact year. Uh, and it's, this ship's in the tropics, which is very good. Four weeks into the dig, Haraldar and Egan have made a dramatic find, the first settlement 
part of the lost kingdom of Tambora. They have uncovered an entire house. Oh. Maybe these people were rich here. Okay. Ornaments and jewelry are beginning to emerge. There are pots made of copper and fragments of fabrics, possibly silk. There is glass and fine porcelain, all indicating that the Tambora people, rather than living in isolation, must have traded with China and India. A poignant picture is emerging of a thriving, prosperous community. Little is known about the people who lived here. It's said that they had their own language and way of life, and that they made their money as horse breeders. The eruption annihilated them, leaving no one to tell their story. But 35 miles away, on the other side of the volcano, there was another village where there were survivors. The village leader of Sangar told his people's story to a British official in a document that still exists. This, this is really an invaluable piece because this actually has the words of the Raja of Sangar in it. So that is the only reliable eyewitness account we have. It was about seven o'clock. Three distinct columns of flame burst forth near the top of the Tambora mountain. In a short time, the whole mountain appeared like a body of liquid fire, extending itself in every direction. The words of the Rajah have helped Haraldar piece together a full picture of the terrible events of April the 10th, 1815. What the Rajah saw was a fiery column rising above the volcano to a great height, and then cascading down in three great streams of glowing material down the flanks of the volcano it must have been a really terrifying sight because they were coming directly towards Sangar. The village was almost completely destroyed. The Raja of Sangar saw people and trees and houses going into the air by whirlwinds. We think that these uh, whirlwind descriptions of houses being broken down and tossed around is actually the phenomenon at the very edge of the pyroclastic surge, destroying everything in its path. Fallout from the eruption covered the island in a toxic blanket up to 10 meters deep. The few people who escaped an instant death faced a slower one. By starvation. Ash swamped the shoreline, killing all life in the sea, so even that source of food was lost. And the land was useless. There wouldn't be another rice harvest for at least five years. Rich or poor, in the end, it made no difference. The family of the Raja of Sangar was badly hit. His daughter died from hunger. And if one considers that he must have been considerably wealthier than all the other people on Sumbawa, that really says something about uh, the dearth of foodstuffs at the time. 90% of the island's population died in the apocalypse more than any other volcanic eruption before or since. Now seven weeks into the dig, the team's tenacity pays off. At last, Haraldar and Egan find what they have been looking for. Egan, I think yeah. these could be teeth. And a jaw it's fragment. Cool. So there's about five teeth here. Yeah. It's... So that's resting there on. So there's a whole jaw there. You can... We have a whole skeleton here. This is the skull. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and the jaw. Yeah. And here's yeah, yeah. Uh, here are the vertebrae. Let me just see oh, the brush, yeah. please. These are the first human remains of the lost kingdom of Tambora ever to have been discovered. They have lain here undisturbed, embedded in volcanic debris for 200 years. It's a very emotional thing to find the people that we know that died in this horrible manner in, the, in this uh, devastating eruption. Well, look at this. The position of the body gives Haraldar a clue about what Tambora's people were doing just before the eruption, how they regarded the volcano. The people, of course, felt threatened by the eruption, but apparently not sufficiently threatened to try to flee away and escape because they didn't know that they were going to be engulfed in, in a surge at 1,000 degrees centigrade in, in an instant. Next to the body are two glass bottles that this person may have been holding at the moment of impact. They show just how much heat was involved. Not only is the glass broken, but it's also melted. So the surge temperature was high enough to soften and melt the glass. And we think that that was around 1,000 degrees centigrade. To be carbonized, in a pyroclastic blast, hot enough to melt glass. That was the fate of the volcano's first victims on the island of Tambora. At the Public Records Office in London, Michael's trawl of the naval logs continues apace. Having completed his overview, he turns back to the logs of the HMS Inconstant to analyze changes in wind patterns. On October the 8th, 1816, 18 months after Tambora erupted, the Inconstant was caught in a violent storm. These log books are full of more than just temperature data. They also have winds and weather and they can record the weather as often as every two hours. So just for one day, for one ship, you're copying quite a bit of information. We see 65,000 uh, temperature observations from the main shipping routes between England and India and China. The worldwide repercussions of the eruption are now much clearer thanks to Michael's discovery of the ship's logs and their hidden clues. For the first time, he can see exactly how much temperatures dropped across the planet and precisely where in the world the cooling was most dramatic. He's found out that the average global temperature dropped by two degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cause a major climate change. And in many places, the temperature drop was much more severe. Summer of 1816 produced temperature departures from normal as large as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Switzerland was near the core, but it happened in a great arc from Ireland through England, across Benelux, and southeast from there. The blue areas on Michael's map show where the cooling was most dramatic. For the first time, we see that Tambora affected the oceans and the tropics, as well as Europe and North America. It was just colder than you ever see it. I mean, the temperatures in parts of uh, Europe and in, particularly in Canada are just well below anything we have in the modern record. I mean, they just shatter the records. Um, there's, not, there's nothing we see in the modern data that matches up with it. Back on the slopes of Mount Tambora, Haraldar's dig is entering its eighth week. He has found a second victim. From the posture, he can see how the person died, and his understanding of exactly what happened continues to take shape. 
This is the second body we found in the house. It's actually just outside the house on the western side. And it's a person that has probably run out of the house seeking shelter behind the building but being killed instantly in the pyroclastic surge. And what we have here is a body that is intensively carbonized, much more so than I've seen in any eruption that I've studied, uh, for example, in Pompeii. This is part of the skull, only fragments remain. Then we have part of the rib cage here. You can see the ribs on this side and the spinal column here, as well as on this side, the spinal column. And finally, we have remains or parts of the leg bones that remain here, as well as in the carbonized surge deposit right here. Over his 35-year career, Haraldar has seen many such bodies, including those at Pompeii. But he has never seen anything like the body on Tambora. It was engulfed in more intense heat, more quickly than anywhere else on Earth. The findings here in Tambora village remind me a great deal of what I've seen in Pompeii. The mode of death of the people is virtually identical, except here the temperature was much higher than the temperature of the pyroclastic surges in Pompeii. After three months, the dig is coming to an end. With just one house excavated so far, two bodies have already been found. With most of the village yet to be uncovered, thousands more victims may still lie hidden beneath the ash. We have to keep reminding ourselves that we're just looking at one house in an entire village, a village that may have had a population of between six and 10,000 people, and a village that probably had the household of the Raja or the king of Tambora. And the king of Tambora almost certainly lived in a palace. That palace still remains to be discovered here in the volcanic deposits. From the evidence he has uncovered, Haraldar can finally reconstruct exactly what happened at the village of Tambora on the 10th of April, 1815. Here in the kitchen, there was a person at the time of the eruption, probably a woman who was maybe cooking a meal, and she was caught in the pyroclastic surge and thrown backward and immediately killed here amongst a variety of tools that you find in the kitchen. At the same time, another person, perhaps her husband, ran outside out of the house, seeking shelter on the west side, downstream from the pyroclastic surge. And we find that body right here in the shelter of the house, but again, totally carbonized and killed instantly in the pyroclastic surge. Tambora had been snorting and snarling for several years before 1815. So when the first explosion occurred on April the 5th, the people probably carried on as usual. Even when ash started falling, they did not leave their homes. They were quite used to the sleeping giant rumbling beneath their feet. Then, five days later, a much larger explosion. With an eruption column, 27 miles high, the highest ever known. The people had just four more hours to live. So the people were probably wondering, are things going to get better or are they going to get worse? Well, they found out around 10 p.m. on the 10th of April, when the style of the eruption dramatically changed. The column collapsed, creating a devastating flow of superheated air. With the pyroclastic blast traveling at more than 100 miles an hour, the Tamborans didn't stand a chance. Haraldar leaves behind an entire civilization 
waiting for future expeditions to uncover. One day, the slopes of Tambora may yield as much data as the site at Pompeii. His work is one more step towards understanding the power of the natural world. I feel really humbled by uh, being in the presence of these remains. And it reminds me how small we are when we're next to the violent forces of nature. And we're here in our lifetime in an instant, but the volcano is going to go on for millions of years and erupt again and again and again. He was a groundbreaking musician who led a tragic life. Beethoven, the man and his music, starts next Friday on BBC Two at nine. The grumpy old men have their say about smelly dogs in ten minutes. After Dear Television, next. <laughs>